Hello, everyone. We are so happy you could join us. Welcome to the Millstone Virtual Career Fair, brought to you by Women in Nuclear and Young Women in Bio. If you cannot join us for today's presentation, we will be recording today's WebEx presentation and posting it on the Young Women in Bio YouTube channel. So feel free to tune in. And again, we're so happy you could join us. My name is Kat, and I work as an electrical and instrumentation and controls engineer in the calculation and analysis group. During today's presentation, we will be explaining what Women in Nuclear is as an organization, telling you a little bit about YWIB, hearing from our six panelists, and then conducting a Q&A session. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation, and we will answer them all during the Q&A session. If you're having any trouble with any of the WebEx features or, the, or submitting questions, we do recommend that you use either Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, or Microsoft Edge. Millstone Station is a nuclear power plant, and it has two commercial operating reactors. The way our reactors work is that high-pressure water in the core of the reactor is heated through the process of nuclear fission. After absorbing the heat, the high pressure water is fed through the tubes of a heat exchanger where the heat is transferred to a separate source of water. The, separate, the other source of water converts, is converted into steam, which is then uh, fed to the, uh, the turbine generator, which converts it to electricity. Within the borders of Connecticut, Millstone Station represents 98% of the carbon-free emissions. We support nearly 4,000 jobs annually and have more than 1,000 direct on-site employees, some of which you will meet today. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jen, and she's going to tell you about the organization Women in Nuclear. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Rowland. I am the chairperson for the Millstone chapter of Women in Nuclear, also known as WIN. WIN is a national organization. Um, we have somewhere around 75 chapters in the United States, and those chapters are made up of nuclear power plants, colleges and universities, universities and colleges that have a chapter, uh, and also other companies power plants. So they might be contract companies and consulting firms. Um, so throughout the United States, there's chapters pretty much in every state and every region. WIN is also a global organization, um, and you can read more about that online. Um, so what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is sort of our mission. And um, as you can see on the slide that's up, um, our organization, WIN, is made up of women and men. For instance, Dominion Energy has a chief nuclear officer out of our corporate office. His name is Dan Stoddard, and he is on the executive committee for WIN. Um, so it's not just women. Um, there are lots of men who get involved and uh, really support women in nuclear, trying to bring more women into the nuclear fields with all the different career paths that are available um, and, and just really support that growth and women moving into management positions. Um, in all these different areas. So our objectives with WIN primarily focus on professional development opportunities. Um, that can be in the form of webinars, meeting with different managers throughout the organization or people in the community and learning about their jobs as related to nuclear. Um, we work with other organizations to network. So a lot of companies have different committees of you know, volunteer committees, diversity, uh, maybe a veterans group. Um, and we, we work with them and try to engage, um, learn about each other and their missions. Uh, we have public outreach, which is uh, today's virtual career fair is a, an example of a public outreach opportunity where we go into schools, maybe K through 12, college or university, or somewhere even um, in our communities where we try to educate people about what women in nuclear do and, and about the nuclear in, uh, energy industry itself and different technologies, uh, nuclear technologies that are out there. And um, of course, we always try to make sure we focus a little on community service and volunteerism, um, you know, just showing that we uh, care about our communities, about keeping them clean, about making sure our public is always safe. Um, 
And if you want to find out more about WIN, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can visit www.winus.org and anyone can become a member. You could be in high school. Um, and even if there is not a nuclear power plant nearby that you can become a member of their chapter, you can sign up as a member at large and you'll receive updates about women nuclear opportunities, conferences, webinars and seminars. And so I hope that you'll check it out. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Kat, who is going to speak to you a little bit um, about YWIB. Thank you, Jen. Young Women in Bio is an organization that empowers today's girls to become tomorrow's leaders, helping them affect positive change through science, technology, engineering, and math, otherwise known as STEM. The goal is to ignite the curiosity and fuel the passion in girls supporting them as they shape and change the world. YWIB give girl, gives girls today the inspiration and support they need to become tomorrow's leaders. Through 13 chapters across the United States, Canada, and Canada, YWIB partners with leading companies, universities, hospitals, and other organizations to host highly engaging educational and motivational programs for young girls interested in STEM. More recently, YWIB has been expanding their offerings to include online and social media platforms to further their outreach and adapt to the changing environment. Please check their calendar of events for future programs in your region or online. YWIB has several national initiatives like Spring Into STEM and other outreach programs that are not listed here, but are listed on their website, womeninbio.org slash YWIB. There are opportunities to be a YWIB ambassador, which is a leadership initiative for high school girls interested in championing and supporting YWIB's efforts to create educa educational and leadership opportunities. YWIB Online, which I've mentioned previously, is a platform that provides free access to online educational and leadership programs. YWIB Club, which is in development, is a toolkit for middle and high school uh, schools to create clubs promoting STEM to girls. And YWIB Teacher, which is also in development, is an initiative to assist teachers engaging STEM and promoting STEM access opportunities for teachers. So with that, my name is Kat, as I said earlier, and I will be your first speaker today. So as I said, I now work in the electrical and INC department of the calculation and analysis group. Uh, when I was in high school, I loved chemistry, I liked biology, and I was not very high on math. When I was considering what to major in for college, I sat down with a guidance counselor and I told him that I was considering majoring in chemical engineering. He told me that it would be too difficult for me. So I did it anyway. And it was incredibly difficult, but entirely worth every effort that I put into it. During my junior year of college, I did my junior thesis about Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. And I did my senior thesis later that same year, also at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. Right away, within the first, you know, maybe week of being there, I knew that this was the industry I wanted to dedicate my life to and where I wanted to be. It was so different than what movies and television make you think the nuclear industry is, and it was so immediately evident that it was worth protecting and, you know, a part of the solution. So after I graduated, I accepted a position at a in nuclear engineering consulting firm. I had a number of roles while I was there. I started as mechanical analysis engineer and I transitioned to do mechanical projects. From there, I ended up transitioning to do INC projects as well. And at the very end, I spent, you know, a couple years doing INC uh, instrumentation and controls, cybersecurity programming. So what is you know, a day in the life of each of those roles look like. For mechanical analysis, uh, we have a number of systems and components in the plant, uh, a very large number. And in the analysis role, um, we would model systems and we would change parameters th throughout the system to reflect, you know, operating conditions, to reflect 
maybe scenarios that are outside of the design basis of the plant. And we would produce calculations that would be used by the plant for any number of reasons. And that was very interesting, but it involved really yourself as the preparer of a calculation or a model and one other reviewer for the most part. And I thought it would be you know, nice to work in larger groups, which is why I transitioned to do project work. And that has its benefits. If when you're working in a large group, you have a lot of opinions and you have a lot more people that are reviewing your work and they might differ. So I transitioned to doing mechanical projects and a lot of the work that took place in that group was replacing items in the plant uh, or if something broke or if we needed to add something new to the plant. And so we would look at what is the plant licensed and designed to do and how does what we're changing impact that licensing and design basis. INC was uh, very similar to what I did for mechanical, except for the components, instead of being maybe compressors, pumps, valves, they were more like recorders, um, wireless access systems. And we dealt a lot more on the control side and, you know, digital components being in integrated into the plant. For cybersecurity, it was how do I integrate, you know, cybersecurity in the past decade has become a huge concern for every industry and not just ours. And we have, you know, made great strides in implementing cybersecurity controls um, as directed by the NRC, but there was a lot of work that went into that for these new systems. So for those of you who might be counting, I majored in chemical engineering. I worked as a mechanical engineer, an INC engineer, and now an electrical engineer. And I don't tell you that for, I mean, I, I explain that because if I could go back and tell, you know, my high school self who was laboring over this decision of what to major in, I would say, your degree is just the beginning of your learning. It is and by no means this constant track that you have to stay on and you have to love it for the rest of your life. And if I, I could tell you all anything, it would be, you know, if you have a good team around you and you have mentors, it's okay to say yes and to, you know, to accept challenging roles and maybe something that you didn't study. So that is uh, what I'd like to communicate to you all today. And without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Ashley. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Orfis, and I am a senior financial analyst here at Millstone. Can everybody hear me? Okay, thanks. Um, I was hired um, at Millstone back in 2002 when I was six months pregnant with a set of twins. Um, my twins are now 17 years old, so if you do the math, I've been here almost 18 years this fall. And um, over those years, I've worked in four different positions over three different departments at Millstone. Um, giving you a little bit of the background, I um, have a four-year degree from the University of Connecticut with a Bachelor of Science, and I majored in accounting. Um, after I graduated, I worked in a regional CPA firm, um, and that would involve like a, a tax season from January to April. And then the rest of the year, we had various clients that we would perform audits of their financial statements. So we would go up to the clients. Um, the clients ranged from groups of doctors to construction companies to even we had an Ivy League campus bookstore. Um, after three years of the work experience, I was then able to sit for the CPA exam, took the exam and passed it. And then my next job was at SNET, which is Southern New England Telephone, um, in their accounting department. So they no longer exist by that name, but they are part of the AT&T family. So you might remember back when, when you had a landline phone in your house uh, and when DSL and fiber, the network was just beginning. Um, I worked there for three years while I um, studied at night to get my MBA at the University of New Haven. And then when I relocated back to Southeastern Connecticut back in 2002, that's what brought me to Millstone. Um, I was hired as a senior accountant and by 2007, I was the only person in our accounting department and I was promoted to the lead accountant. Um, typical functions um, in an accounting role, I was responsible for all of the journal entries needed to close the books each month, um, reconciliations of all of our balance sheet accounts, 
and a lot of analysis, um, basically the actual expenses, comparing them to what we had budgeted and year over year when you compare your actuals from one year to the year before and try and explain why you are higher or lower. Um, we also have two joint owners that own 6% of unit three at Millstone. So as their accountant, I was responsible for their forecasts, uh, their budgets and their monthly billing. Um, then in 2010, Millstone Dominion went through a reorganization and my accounting department was centralized and moved down to our headquarters in Virginia. I was able to accept a position still at Millstone in the senior cost analyst as a senior cost analyst in our project controls group. That group rolls up through the engineering department. So I basically was the cost analyst for several of the project managers in the group who were running the um, capital projects that we were doing on site from start to finish, from getting the funding to implementing, to seeing the project through, um, through the end. And as their cost person, I would help them with their funding requests. I would create their purchase orders, um, forecast what they were spending, track their invoices. And finally, when the project was implemented, um, I would do the paperwork to make sure that fixed assets would set the asset up properly so we could start depreciating it. Um, a few years later, 2015, I took another position where I am today. I'm a senior financial analyst in the finance and business services group. Um, in our group, there are four of us and we handle everything related to the site that involves expenses. Uh, we create the budget, which is in excess of $250 million a year. Um, we have a couple dozen probably departments. Each one has its own budget for labor, material services, and other categories. We put together their monthly forecasts and explain variances again when we have actuals and compare them to what we had budgeted. Um, the job is fast paced because um, like the work scope on site is always changing. Um, we always have new government regulation, an epidemic like COVID. Um, the bottom line is that many of the decisions that are made um, on site by management will have an impact on what we spend on our bottom line. So overall, I've been very fortunate to be a part of the Millstone team. Um, I've been able to take my degree and use my analytical skills across three different departments, the accounting, finance, and engineering. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Maria. She is in our chemistry department. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria. Can everyone hear me? Okay. So as Ashley said, I work in the chemistry department here at Millstone. Um, what that job consists of is a variety of work. It's both in the lab, in the field, and a little bit in the office. So on a regular basis, I start my day out by getting um, taking rounds. So I go out into the field, I start out in the turbine building, and I monitor sample flow and various um, readings and make sure that everything's trending as we expect. If something doesn't look the way that it's supposed to, then either I need to investigate it or try to see if we need to make adjustments to our chemical injections or something like that to affect the chemistry of the plant. Um, we go out and sample different things. Um, every day it's something different. We have weekly requirements, we have hourly requirements, so it depends on what we have to sample and just making sure that those samples are giving us the results that we expect. Um, that helps it so that our operators can run the plant the way that they need to manage everything. Um, my favorite sample point is actually the ocean. So once a week we do something that is called shocking the bays. And so what we do is we inject sodium hypochlorite into the ocean. Um, and what that does is it prevents growth on the pipes that bring surface water in that cools the plant. Um, so it's just enough to prevent growth, but not enough to harm the environment. So my job to sample is to make sure that we're injecting the right amount. Um, I like that because I actually studied environmental biology. So my favorite thing to do is be outside. Um, so I kind of wanted to tie in what Kat was saying earlier, and that's that you don't have to study what you're going to go into. I could have never told you I would be in chemistry. It was my least favorite class in college, not going to lie. Um, but I love my job. So I get to work in a lab, which is very similar to environmental science or environmental biology. So you just never know what you're going to end up doing. Um, so another cool thing about working here is I'm actually still pursuing environmental. So I'm actually getting my master's degree in environmental and energy management. So if you pick a degree that is in line with your career, you're able to keep going to school. 
And as long as I maintain my grades, then the company reimbursed me. So I definitely encourage anyone in any STEM field to look for a job where you can get tuition paid for for your master's. Instead of continuing to get debt, I'm able to go to school at night online and able to continue working in my degree. But instead of getting debt, I'm building a savings account. So I definitely recommend anyone in the STEM career to try and do that. Um, and in addition to that, it's kind of cool. We have people from all different levels talking to you today. So I'm just beginning my career at Millstone. So I've been here for two years. I started out um, offsite. I was a contractor and I did proctoring for an outage. So if you see job postings for temporary work, I encourage you to apply. So I came in just for two months to do some work for the outage completely unrelated administering computer-based testing. And then I ended up getting to meet people and getting contacts. And when the chemistry position opened, I knew about it and I was able to apply for it. And that's what got me to where I am right now. So I definitely encourage you to branch out to other fields that you wouldn't always think about and to look at jobs in different degrees because when we hire like for a chemistry technician, we don't just hire chemistry majors. We have people from engineering, we have people from biology, from environmental, from electrical, it's all different people um, that are able to come and work in these positions. So just like Kat said, a lot of things you learn, you're gonna learn in your career, um, not necessarily at school. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jen. Hi again, this is Jennifer Rowland. Um, I work in the licensing and compliance department at Millstone Power Station. Um, I also support environmental compliance, uh, which is new to me. Um, I'm in my 20th year of my career. Um, but as uh, some folks have already mentioned earlier, you know, you don't always need to know what you're going to do. It's you're never too old to learn new things. Um, I got started working actually when I was 12. So before my professional career started from about 12 to 22, I worked 10 years at a golf course. Um, I grew up in a family that it didn't really matter what you did. You just had to work. And um, I really enjoyed working at the golf course because I, I learned a lot of people skills, customer service. I learned you know, about the golf industry, sales, uh, working with vendors, uh, but I made some great connections. People that ended up writing letters of recommendation for me uh, to go to college, um, folks that have been references to this day or up until this point, anytime I did uh, make a career change. Um, I went to college at Central Connecticut State University and earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the School of Business. And their business degree primarily focused on business law, management, accounting, finance, um, marketing, and communications. So I learned a lot of computer skills and just really just an overview of all things business. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew a business degree was going to afford me a lot of opportunities. Um, it was going to open a lot of doors. Um, you know, it didn't matter if I was in an engineering company, if I was in a marketing firm. Um, most most businesses need someone with a business degree, no matter what um, what the industry is. I spent one year on the road with NASCAR doing a marketing for motorsports uh, position, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but you know, it it really wasn't something I was going to pursue. Um, and so when I graduated college, I applied to the same company that a lot of people in my family had worked for, called Pratt and Whitney Aircraft, which is part of United Technologies. And I thought just as my father, grandfathers, aunts, uncles, cousins had all worked there, they worked 30 years, they retired. I'm, you know, I was still in that mindset of you just need to have a job, you know, something, you know, you're either good at something you enjoy. And if you're lucky enough, you'll have a combination of both. Um, but I was there just for a short time, less than a year when September 11th happened. Many of you watching today may not even have been born at that time. Um, but just like COVID had changed the world today with how it affected the airline industry, Pratt & Whitney built commercial jet engines um, and military engines. And that event of September 11th affected the airline industry pretty significantly, significantly as well. So a lot of people were laid off and that came as quite a shock. Um, and what I, where I thought I was gonna be for a long time, that door just suddenly closed. Um, I scrambled to get my resume to every headhunter, temp agency, or business I could walk into, because that's how we did it then, which was by paper. Um, and a few weeks later, I got an offer from a construction site, which happened to be the Connecticut Yankee nuclear power plant, which was being decommissioned. And what that means is 
essentially are taking the plant apart in the reverse order it was put together. The plant no longer operated, but there were still years of work to be done in order to take it apart and return it back to a green field. So in that time, um, I worked in what was called the Corrective Actions Program, turned out to be about uh, almost a five-year position, uh, started off supposed to only be a few months, and I was lucky enough to turn it into the start of a real career. Um, and even though when that ended, I couldn't get into Millstone Power Station, I had tried, they just weren't hiring. Um, I ended up working for the United States Navy and the Coast Guard um, with a contract company um, locally in the state of Connecticut. I stayed with them about eight years, and that was mostly military training and cybersecurity. Um, and one day I just decided it was time to put my resume back out there, um, wanted to keep pursuing new opportunities. And sure enough, uh, I got a call from Dominion Energy, which owns and operates Millstone Power Station. They offered me an interview um, and I came in and, and I've been there ever since. So I'm in my, uh, about to round out my fifth year um, at Millstone. Um, and as I said, I've, I'm now working in environmental. So I've actually changed positions a few times within licensing compliance, but overall it's been a great experience. And I would encourage, um, I would encourage all of you to never be afraid to try new things. Um, if you find yourself in a position and you're not getting as much out of it as you might've thought, or there aren't promotional opportunities to get back out there and look again, you know, but it is important to always have a job, no matter what that is, every job is worthy and, and adds value, you know, back to our communities. Um, and, it, and it helps you continue to grow no matter what you're doing. So uh, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to one of our amazing female nuclear operators, Ann Chapman, um, and she's awesome. So Ann, Turning it over. Well, thank you, Jen, for that great introduction. <laughs> uh, my name is Ann Chapman, and I work in operations at Millstone Unit 2. Um, I've been here um, almost 12 years now, and uh, I also worked at Unit 1. Uh, let's see. I also worked at Unit One when uh, when they were still operating. Uh, that unit is being uh, is going to be in decommissioning mode soon. Um, so I'll just go uh, back a little bit to when I was in high school. Uh, the things that I like to do. Um, I I loved school. I I really did. Uh, I I liked uh, math and science. Um, especially um, physics was uh, was one area of study that I liked, and I like to read a lot. I like to do puzzles and and solve things and and um, play strategy games and and figure things out how things worked. But I didn't really I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, originally, I thought I would major in physics, um, but my guidance counselor um, kind of steered me away from that because. I wasn't, I didn't think I was interested in being a teacher. So he said that was the only career path for a physics major. So, um, which I found out later was not true. <laughs> so sometimes you have to do a little of your own digging to um, guidance counselors don't know everything. So if you get out there and uh, find out information on your own, that's, uh, that's always a good backup. Uh, so I ended up um, getting into a scholarship program that that was um, in, locally here in Connecticut, uh, in Norwich, Connecticut, at um, Thames Valley, which I now, which now is called Three Rivers Community College. So I, uh, I got to go to school for free for two years. Got a nuclear engineering degree, uh, associate's degree, and um, that that's one of the minimum requirements to get into the job that I'm in now. So as um, some people talked earlier. Um, you don't have to have a nuclear engineering degree to come here. Um, any two year engineering degree or a four year engineering degree uh, will meet the requirements, uh, the minimum requirements to, to uh, get a job in operations. And um, they do, uh, they do like degrees or they, uh, they like Navy experience too. The Navy also trains in the nuclear um, technologies. So those are two different paths that you could you could get into operations uh, in the nuclear field. 
Uh, so I came in um, as a, uh, I call them plan equipment operators, and that's an entry level position. And we walk around the plant, and I just have a picture here of the plant from, from an aerial view. I don't know if everybody can see that. It's a fairly large uh, property, and there's uh, a lot of buildings. Um, you're assigned to uh, one of the units, so you're responsible for usually one area of the one unit that you're assigned to. And you walk around, uh, you have a checklist of things that you that you check and make sure that equipment's running right, make sure everything sounds right and uh, is what we expect. And if it's not, then um, then you you know you would do some investigation, get other people involved, and um, and have may, may other departments would take over to fix the problem. So um, I was here a couple of years, a qualified as a, a plant equipment operator, and then I had the opportunity to go to license school, and that uh, was about a, a 18 month school, and it's run by the company. And I was successful in that, and I was able to get a license from the government to uh, be a reactor operator on Millstone Unit 2. And um, I felt like that was a pretty big accomplishment. There's there's not a lot of um, reactor operators, even in the country or the world. There's It's kind of a small group, relatively. Um, it's, it's a really interesting job. It's... Um, it takes a little bit of engineering knowledge, a little bit of communication skills, a little bit of um, uh, teamwork, like many jobs do, and um, it, it's really, it's been really interesting, really interesting job. Uh, things change a lot. As a um, as a reactor operator, my my daily job would be, um, I would go into the control room, and there has to be someone there all the time. Uh, actually, there has to be at least three people there all the time to to watch the reactor and make sure the plant is running like it's supposed to. And um, so there's another crew there. So I would go in and and have a turnover process with uh, with the other person there, so they could leave and I would take over. And I have another picture here. This is um, this is the control room. Is um, I, if you've seen. Um, like an airline cockpit, like a large jet. There's a, a lot of uh, gauges and controls and, um, you know, computer things there that, that help the pilots to fly the plane. And it's similar in a, uh, in a control room for, for a uh, power plant in that, um, well, I'll show you the picture. There's a lot of, Everybody can see this here. Um, there's a lot of controls. There's a lot of gauges and um, alarm panels, and um, it, it's a little bit difficult to because you're not actually looking at the equipment. You're just looking at some indications of the equipment. So you have to kind of um, figure out in your mind, you know, what you're looking at and what it means. So my job uh, in the control room, there's two re two reactor operators in the control room, and one of us will um, control the the reactivity of the reactor. So uh, that's our job for the day. We would uh, take rounds, so we'd walk around, look at all the gauges, we would document uh, all the instrumentation that we track, and then the other person uh, would. Uh, coordinate jobs for for the day. So if we're doing, um, we have to do uh, testing on equipment. We would um, coordinate with other people in our group, like the plant equipment operators, uh, maybe instrument uh, and control techs, uh, maybe maintenance, and um, so we would help coordinate the work and then actually manipulate any equipment that needs to be needs to be. Um, needs to be changed, turned off or turned on or or those kinds of things. So it's been a very interesting job. I, I get to go to school uh, continuously in my job. Uh, every five weeks we go to we go to school and we practice. And it's kind of like uh, part of my job is is kind of like being a um, like a first responder. 
where if something uh, bad happens at the plant, something breaks, or we have some kind of major power issue, um, then we're responsible to uh, put the plant in a safe condition. So since those kind of things don't happen that often, then we have a simulator that we go and we practice we practice on the simulator so that we um, are proficient and we know how to handle all different kinds of issues if they come up. So it's been really interesting. It's continuous learning and um, I've had a great support um, through the company and through my supervisors being part of a team. It's been a really great experience. And uh, next year I'll be going back to school for my senior reactor operator license. So then I'll be in the supervisory role, also in the control room. And I'm really looking forward to that. It's uh, it's a good career advancement and uh, a little different perspective on, on uh, running a nuclear power plant. So I apologize, I'm not good at keeping track of time. So <laughs> has anyone else kept track of my time for, I think I'm close to five minutes. Um, I, I would encourage uh, anyone who's who's looking uh to 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 either get into the nuclear industry or um you know or deciding your career path um you know keep keep uh, an open mind and uh, do a little research yourself and it, and like other speakers have said you don't it doesn't have to be you don't have to study um like i've told my kids um, it's kind of good to pick like an engineering or or liberal arts, you know, like which direction you want to go there. Um, but if you're interested in engineering or a business, you know, you just go start going down a path and you're going to make connections and, and you'll figure it out along the way. All right, well, thanks for your time and I'll turn it uh, over to Rachel. All right, thank you, Ann. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel D. Amber. I am the supervisor for electrical and INC, which stands for instrumentation and control systems engineering here at Millstone. Uh, so a little bit back about myself. I graduated with my degree in biological and biomedical engineering from Cornell, where I was also a Navy ROTC candidate. So I was became a commissioned officer in the United States Navy, served on board on my first ship. Uh, the use of San Antonio as a combat electronics division officer in charge of everything from navigations to radars to encrypted radios. Um, really learned a lot there. Then I went into the Navy nuclear training pipeline that uh, Ann mentioned quickly. So I did the Navy nuclear training uh, down in uh, South Carolina and then up in New York. Uh, and then I went on to the USS Enterprise. Uh, to serve as the reactor controls division officer, where I um, oversaw dual reactor operations for a period of two years uh, through decommission and deactivation of a number of reactors. And my group was directly in charge of uh, everything that controls the reactivity. So control rods and other instrumentations and uh, control systems. Uh, once I left the ship, I went to be the program manager for the new plot program, which is the nuclear propulsion officer candidate program, which is a, a work study program that we uh, do through colleges that Navy does through colleges is uh, countrywide nationwide uh, looking at, uh, you know, bringing on smart individuals who want to look, look at being either a surface warfare officer, which is what I did. I served on two service ships or as a submarine officer, which is open to women. Uh, so submarines are open to women. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. After that, um, I decided to uh, step out of uniform. I have two small children and uh, my husband is still a serving member of the United States uh, Submarine Force uh, as an engineer right now. Uh, so I uh, stepped out. Uh, the Navy had brought us to, us to uh, Groton, which is right next to Waterford where Millstone is located. And uh, luck had it, the uh, electrical and INC system supervisor position, which is, has some connections to my previous job in the Navy was open. And so I was hired here at Dominion. And that's where I've been for the last uh, three years now, uh, Dominion working with uh, the electrical engineers underneath me. Um, they look at, uh, at, they control everything from the 345 KV switchyard all the way down to circuit board systems, control systems, 
a few digital systems and we really look at system performing monitoring trending we want to ensure that uh, all the systems stay online available and reliable for the operators like Ann. so uh, it's really what the engineers do lots of different small jobs that we do a lot of different things uh, one of our favorite sayings here in engineering is you, le you learn a, a new thing every day. It's never the same day over and over again. So um, it's pretty cool there. So um, along the way, I managed to pick up my master's in uh, uh, engineering management through University of Arkansas. Uh, so that is another way to kind of expand my own knowledge and kind of see uh, engineering from a different light. So I liked that a lot. Um, kind of tie it back to what other people have mentioned too. Um, one thing I would say to take away as a biomedical engineer who has done nothing but electrical engineering her entire career uh, is that, uh, you know, that technical curiosity and scientific mindset that you have will, will take you wherever you need to go. Just be willing to recognize your own strengths and ask for help and mentorship along the way and you'll get where you need to go. Uh, with that, um, I'm finished. So I'm going to turn it back over to Kat for any questions uh, that people have. And thank you so much for listening. Kat? A big thank you to our panelists and Margo. Uh, it was wonderful to hear from all of you and a lot of great, great intel and insight. So the first question we have is for Anne. No surprise there. <laughs> is uh, hello, Anne. Do you have to wear a special suit for safety as you monitor the nuclear reactor control room and other areas? Okay, that's a good question. Um, in the control room, we don't actually have to wear anything special um, except my uniform. <laughs> we all wear uniforms. Um, but in the plant, we do, yes. When we go out in the buildings, um, it's a lot of them are noisy, so we have to wear hearing protection. Um, it's an industrial site, so um, there are a lot of hazards. So we, we wear hard hats and safety glasses in most areas. And uh, often we'll wear uh, gloves, work gloves, if we have to climb a ladder or operate something in the plant. Um, what, what makes nuclear unique is um, we do have contamination in some areas, which is um, radioactivity that, that gets out um, onto surfaces in the plant in certain areas. So if we have to go into an area like that, um, it, our health physics techs would identify those areas and they're all marked off with um, special uh, labeling. And then we have special, we do have special suits to wear in those areas. Um, and they're, it's protective clothing. So it's, um, we wear like booties and um, they're uh, white. They're, they're not cotton, but they're, they're kind of, kind of like a suit you would wear, like if you were painting and um, gloves and a hood. Uh, to protect us to not get the contamination on us. And then when we leave those areas, uh, we have a, a, a dress out area where we um, we take off the contaminated clothing and put it in special containers and, and then the other people, you know, take care of that, get rid of it. So good question, thanks. All right, our next question is for Ashley. Um, oh, and uh, Rachel, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say something that to kind of go along with Anne was saying with uh, the special suits. We all do wear uh, the symmetry devices here that allow us to understand what we're being exposed to. But one of the things that Dominion and the nuclear industry has as a whole is a very strong focus on radiological safety. So every person who comes on site is trained in the proper manners of dealing with that, how to properly handle that. And that's part of the suits that Ann was mentioning um, that are there as a protective measure. Uh, most people do not get contaminated. It is not that free, uh, but it's there for us to have that sensitivity like we do with our hearing protection and other elements as well. So that safety is foremost and paramount here at Dominion and across the industry. Thank you, Rachel. And um, I don't know if you all can see that is roughly what that suit looks like. Um, very fashion forward. But we really were worried, concerned about safety. So the next question that we have is for Ashley. And it is, what is the cost of a, like a typical project? Okay. 
Um, okay, but a capital project, they can range. Um, we have certain ones that we call cap annuals. They have to be under $250,000. Um, we've had projects that are $40 million. So each one's different. Um, and also it's categorized whether it meets um, capitalization requirements or we have to expense it right off the bat. So we, we do large and small projects. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. The next question is, do you also use robots to clean up? Uh, Rachel, do you want to speak to this one? So um, we do use robots in a different uh, sense, a uh, couple different roles here. We are looking in engineering at the use of drones to perform inspections that are just either in inaccessible areas for people, but also to allow us to kind of uh, be a little bit more efficient and thorough with our reviews. So we've done that in our recent past maintenance periods where we brought in different robots, different drones to allow us to get a more 360, more thorough review of, of you know, different plant equipment, either the, like say the internals uh, of the main generator, that's a very condensed area, very confined space. So it's a better use to use a robot to go in there and let us fully look at the inspection, kind of see all the different parts from different angles. And then we review that 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 uh, video at the end. As for uh, decontamination, uh, that one we would have to probably potentially take as a look up. Thank you, Rachel. Um, the next question that we have is about how we've been handling um, COVID-19. And I think, you know, the best people, there's there certain jobs that, you know, we come on site for. So the question is, um, are we able to do any more work remotely and how have we been affected by COVID-19? And Maria and Jen, uh, Maria and then Jen, if you guys want to speak to this, because we have different roles and, you know, different roles do different things. So I, if I could just do a repeat back, that's something we do in the nuclear industry because I didn't fully hear um, what Kat just said. You were asking about COVID-19. Could you repeat your question? Absolutely. Love the three-way communication. Um, the question is, how have we been impacted by COVID-19 and are there some jobs that we can do remotely? So I can speak a little bit to that. Um, we, you know, we took COVID-19 and uh, the early discussions and, and what was happening uh, in the United States and around the world very seriously. Um, back in mid-March, most people who could work remotely. Um, so if you're not someone who actually needs to go into the plant to physically manipulate parts, components, controls, um, if you're not someone who actually needs to be on site um, to do your job and to do it successfully, then those folks were given opportunities to work remotely at home. Um, much of what I did in licensing and what I do in licensing, I was able to do at home, uh, such as like writing correspondence to the government, but there were times I did have to show up on site. Um, for instance, uh, walk downs of stormwater drains or looking at um, compliance, air compliance and things like that. So there are times you have to physically be there. But our site took temperature controls, the wearing of masks, hand sanitizing stations um, around every corner very seriously. And even when we are at work, we don't gather in any way. So most of our meetings went to um, what we call like a ready talk, a conference call, or we would use um, a platform such as what we're doing now, um, like a video Zoom call or WebEx. Um, Maria, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, so for my job, we have to have somebody here on site 24 seven. We always have somebody in the chemistry department. Um, so we weren't really able to work from home um, we did take a little bit of a step back with our training program and we had some of our trainings done at home, but as far as working on site, we still have to have people here. So um, just like Jen said, we do have the temperature controls and we have to make sure that we are always wearing masks when we're in groups and we spread out our office spaces a little bit. And um, aside from that, we do still have to make sure that someone's here all the time. It's one of the perks of being essential, but um, we definitely did what we could. And one thing that we did do differently is 
Um, every night um, and every morning when you start a shift, we have a meeting in the control room usually. So I get to go into the control room where Ann works and we have a meeting where we talk about the shift and what we're gonna do for that day. Um, so instead of going up in person, um, we would call in and we did the meeting that way for a while. Um, and then now we've moved to a spot where we're still going to the meetings, but we are still wearing the mask. So whenever we go in and we're in a group, we have on masks. Thank you, Jen and Maria. Um, so our next question is, what advice would you give to females pursuing a career in engineering? And I don't know if Rachel, if you and I can take this one, if you want to start it off. Uh, what advice, the, the three way, what advice would I give somebody to start off a career in engineering? Um, well, let's see. I think my first advice is what I said, to have that technical curiosity, always be uh, willing to ask the next why question. Why is that? Why, where can I learn that? And why is that? Um, always be willing to kind of step out a little bit out of your comfort zone um, and kind of always give that self you know, that mental stretch every day that you can do. Um, and then uh, I think that's, that's what I've got for right now. You know, always, always reach for the stars type of thing. Kat? My biggest uh, piece of advice would be uh, develop mentors and learn how to become a mentor. Um, you know, practice being mentored and being a mentee. And then, you know, swap those roles because, you know, like I've said during my career, career talk, I've had to do a number of different uh, number of different jobs and I haven't always known exactly, you know, I, I was not, you know, a tech, technical expert at the beginning and the expert in anything was once a beginner. So cultivate mentors and people that you trust. So that way, when you know you don't know something or when you develop a position uh, that can help you answer a problem that you can, you know, bounce your ideas off someone and that you have someone that you know, you can trust. So even if you have, you know, the question that you are like, oh, maybe I don't want to ask that in front of everyone, I can ask my mentor or, you know, they also help you grow uh, personally as well. And the second thing that I would say is let other, like, don't, don't be the one that will tell you, don't limit yourself and tell yourself you can't. Um, you can, and as long as you are, like, Rachel has said, as long as you're technically curious, you can learn. There is, you know, there is so many people in engineering that are around you to help you. It's always a team. We don't do anything by ourselves. We work in the plant as a team. We're always, we rely on one, on one another explicitly, not just in engineering. You know, we all rely on, you know, good communication and we rely on each other to give accurate information and repeat accurate information back. And so, you know, you can because you have a good team around you. And for our last question, what is the coolest place in the plant? Now, I think every and you can start us off. If we, I don't know if we want to, you know, if you want to tell us your coolest place that you've been in, in the plant. Um, uh, yeah, I have the coolest place. <laughs> so the coolest place is the uh, top of the turbine building. <laughs> and uh, that's because you can see the fireworks from there when you're working on uh, on on Fourth of July. <laughs> but it's uh, it's just really neat. I mean, you can see the whole site, and it's a really beautiful area. You know, we're we're right on on Niantic Bay, and uh, it's really pretty. And uh, from the turn building roof, you can see either the sunrise or the sunset. So <laughs> you can see both sides of the site. So it's, uh, I think that's the coolest place. And I'd like to sort of uh, further on something that you just mentioned about uh, the, the beauty that surrounds um, a lot of nuclear power plants. Because we need water, uh, a water source nearby, so many are along the shorelines or beautiful lakes and mountains, uh, mountain lakes, things like that. So. Uh, the one really nice thing about our plant is it's also, it's an estuary. It's a wildlife sanctuary in a lot of ways. Um, we're at the end of a peninsula surrounded by water, practically on three sides. Um, so they're actually 
really beautiful sites to be at in most cases. Uh, Millstone Power Station in Connecticut is probably number one or two uh, for its for its spectacular views and the boats going by every day. Uh, but we we take that environment very seriously about keeping our site um, just really pristine. And, and everyone takes a lot of pride, I think, um, in just taking walks at lunch around the property and um, enjoying the views we get from our office buildings. Uh, they're pretty incredible. I personally, um, oh, Maria, you go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, for me, the coolest place on site, I think, is the spent fuel pool. Um, so there's a pool just outside of containment um, in the re reactor building um, where we keep the fuel once it's been used up and it stays there to stay cool and to decay. And so you can see into the pool and it's kind of cool during outages because you get to watch them like use cranes to move the fuel around. So that's my favorite place. And uh, my favorite place within the plant is in containment. Um, I got to uh, climb up on top of the circular crane that sits at the top of containment and you can look down into the reactor vessel. And that was a really, really cool place to, uh, that was probably the coolest place I've ever been in the plant. Ashley, do you have, do you get to spend a lot of time in the plant? I have obviously been out in the plant not too often, and I I have one of the jobs more of a support function. I've been home with COVID uh, due to COVID since March, so I have not even been on site. Um, I might be the only one in our group to say that, um, but I would have to say that our finance department we have one of the best areas to work in on site. We're on the fifth floor of Building 475, looking out on Nyanic Bay, um, so it's very pretty and it, it's great. Great view overlooking the A-frame and um, we have a volleyball field and it's nice. Hey, what about you, Rachel? Well, uh, for me, it's a, a little hard to pick one. Um, uh, to be literal, the coolest place might be the intakes because uh, it's, a, it's a different method here from the Navy plants where we have to pull all the water in. And so you got these big, pumps that pull all the, the seawater, which we call service water here, uh, in to cool the plants and cool all the different components. Uh, so I always thought that was kind of an interesting way to see how it's uh, a little bit separated. Um, and then uh, I also uh, uh, appreciate the uh, large switch, switch yard and transformers that we use to send out all of our electricity that we make. Uh, it's also something very different than my uh, my old Navy style of nuclear power. So I uh, appreciate those differences. And then I would say the last thing that might go to address an upcoming question is, I think uh, one of the coolest places that we have is actually not in the plant and it's out in training. Uh, we have two full simulators that completely mock the control room that they use to train the operators. And we have what we call a see-through reactor where you can also see so it's using water and a little small battery to see the same processes just on a miniaturized scale. And I think that focus on training uh, is very unique and very interesting to, to both the nuclear industry and, and just in general that you have this ability to uh, run everyone through these scenarios while still completely operating the plant and making power. So I think that's another really interesting fact, you know, facet to, to the site. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to all of our panelists and our host, Margo. Um, we hope you enjoyed uh, our presentation, and like we said at the beginning, it has been recorded and it will be posted on the YWIB uh, YouTube platform. So if anyone you know may be interested in our presentation, uh, feel free to view it in YWIB online. Uh, thank you everyone very much, and have a nice day.